Good morning. You'll remember, Pastor Kenny has been preaching for a while now on Jesus in Genesis. And chapter 11 preached on the, well, we heard about the Tower of Babel. And since then, chapter 12 onward, we've been learning about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Last week, Isaac was finding his bride. This week, Jacob is working towards that. We'll see Jacob's dream and God's ladder, as the sermon is titled. But just think on the, the thought that in chapter 11, man tried to create a stairway to heaven through the Tower of Babel. Through the last dozen or so chapters, God has been up to something. And this is the grand reveal where Jacob learns that God himself has been making a stairwell to heaven through Jacob and the line that ultimately leads to Jesus. We'll be reading the entirety of chapter 28 today starting with verse 1. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham, to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, and sent him away to Padan Aram to take to himself a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother, and had gone to Padanaram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married. Besides the wives that he had had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister Neboiath. Uh, then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, the ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall the all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you, give a tenth to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this passage. Lord, just how clearly it shows your redemptive plan. And just as you turned aside man's failed plans in chapter 11 there, that you already had your plan in the works and laid out, leading to our eternal path of salvation. We thank you to get to hear this passage explained and preached to us, Lord, and we ask that you help us grow through it. We pray for those who are listening online and watching maybe today or in the future that you help this work on them as well and grow us all together as a body for you, Lord. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right. We're looking at Genesis chapter 28. And throughout my life, and yours as well, we have heard Sunday school lessons and songs and sermons that talk about Jacob's ladder. 
Well, there's several things wrong with that, which make it just wrong. First of all, it's not a ladder. It's a stairway. As um, Eric has already alluded to, the language here in this passage is the same as in the passage of Genesis 11 uh, that Bo preached on several months ago now. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a ziggurat. It's a stairway. So it's not a literal ladder like we think of. Secondly, Jacob doesn't build it. It's not Jacob's ladder. It's God's ladder. Men have tried to build a ladder unsuccessfully. And you know, men are still trying to build ladders which serve as gateways to God. It's called religion. It can be under the guise of morals, morality, ethics. But God builds a ladder that does not depend on the works of man it's not one that God has to come down and look at. It is one that goes, in fact, into heaven. And we will see that this morning. And then we will look at the end of the message at the recast of this in the Gospel of John where Jesus reveals the ultimate interpretation of Jacob's vision. So we're going to begin this morning, we're going to do it much like we did last week, we'll look at the contours of the chapter, essentially the outline, uh, then the redemptive future of it through the covenant line and then the shadows or typology that we see here as well. So chapters 25 through 27 of Genesis, which we left off at 24 last week, these include the death of Abraham. After Isaac meets his bride in chapter 24, chapter 25 records Ishmael's legacy and then the story of the miraculous birth of the twins that are born to Rebekah. Rebecca was barren as Sarah had been, and Isaac prays for her and she has two sons. The first comes out and he's all red, and so they name him Esau. And the second one comes out and he's holding on to Esau's heel. And so they call him heel grabber, Jacob. And Jacob turns out to be more than a heel grabber, Jacob is just a heel, period. He's not a good guy, and God works on him a long time. But an unusual thing happens in the natural line of primogeniture where the firstborn gets the double possession and the blessing of the father. God says about these twins, he says the, the older is going to serve the younger. The younger is going to be the one that I'm going to bless. Then chapter 26 deals mostly with Isaac and Abimelech and also well, I'm going to go back to chapter 25 for just a moment. Something very important happens at the end of that chapter as the two boys have grown up. Esau comes in one day from hunting. He's had uh, you know, no luck. You know what they call that. They, they, you know what you call hunters who have no luck. You call them vegetarians. That's an old joke but anyway. Um, but he's had no luck, and so Jacob, who is the guy who likes to stay close to the camp, uh, he's cooked a stew, red stuff. And Esau says, I'd like to have some of that stew, some of that red stuff, and Jacob says, well, fine, here, I can see you're hungry, have a bowl full and some crackers. No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says, what will you give me for it? And Esau says, well, I'm about to die. Well, what do you want? He says, I'll take your birthright. Well, Esau says, well, what good's my birthright going to be to me if I'm dead? Okay, you can have my birthright. That's his promise of double blessings and the blessing of the father. And Jacob says, okay, deal. And things go on. We see chapter 26 again. Then in chapter 27, Jacob gets the rest of Esau's right of primogeniture by deceiving his father Isaac in collusion with his mother, Rebekah. So we see that Esau dearly loves his father Isaac, and Isaac loves Esau, and Rebekah loves Jacob, and Jacob loves Rebekah. There's favoritism and partiality on two sides. Well, you know how it goes. 
Isaac thinks he's dying. And many times the patriarchs think they're dying. It's going to be 20 more years before he actually dies. But he says, I'm dying and I, I want to give you, Esau, my, my blessing. And so go out and kill me a, a, a deer and bring it back and fix me a stew. And then I'm going to give you the blessing. So he goes out and he's hunting. And while he's away, Rebecca has heard all of this. And she says to Jacob, she says, we're going to make a stew for your father. And I want you to take it in and get the blessing. Well, he says, there's no way he's going to do that because Esau's a hairy guy and I'm not. She says, you let me take care of that. You just get ready. And so Isaac does something that we should never do. I heard Jim Stalling say this. This is so good. I, uh, Jacob comes in and he begins to talk to his father. And he says, I brought you the stew and all of this. And Jacob says, you know, you sound like Jacob. Come here. Come here, son. Let me feel you. And he feels him. He says, well, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau so you must be Esau and you see here is the trap of letting your feelings overcome what you hear never let your feelings rule you we all have feelings and emotions but they shouldn't rule us so Isaac gives Jacob the blessing and then Esau comes in right after Isaac or right after Jacob leaves and he says, here's the stew, and I'm ready for my blessing. And he says, wait a minute. He says, I've already given your blessing. And Esau figures things out very quickly, and he says, you've given it to Jacob. Don't you have a blessing for me? And he says, I can't give you Jacob's bl or the blessing. I can't rescind it. It's Jacob's now. And Esau vowed, he says, I'm going to kill Jacob. When my father dies, I'm going to kill Jacob. Again, not knowing it was going to be 20 years before Isaac dies. Rebecca hears this, and she knows that she doesn't want her favorite son to be killed by her least favored son. And so in verse 46 of chapter 27, she says to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. And the reason she says this is because Esau has taken Canaanite wives, two of them. And she says, I don't want my son to marry a Canaanite. If he does, what good will my life be to me? I'd just as soon be dead than to see Jacob marry a Canaanite. Well, her motivation here is not really good, and we see that throughout this chapter, but it is in line with God's plan. Sometimes God uses less than perfect people and less than perfect motives to accomplish his means. So she tells Isaac this, and he calls Jacob. He blessed him and charged him and said, okay, go take a wife. And so this is the situation as we come to this chapter. Rebekah knows Esau plans to kill Jacob. Jacob knows Esau plans to kill him. And so in order to escape the death camp, Jacob heads out to the work camp. Only he doesn't know it yet. Because he's going to meet his match in Laban. One deceiver will meet another. So I want you to have this, the, the picture here. When he leaves, he is, he is not this obedient servant like the servant of Abraham that we saw in chapter 24. He doesn't have the purest of motives He's just trying to get out of a bad situation. He's like Everett. Remember Everett on Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? We talked about it at the funeral yesterday. There was Elbert, Peter, and Delmar, and they escaped the prison camp. And they're in the loft of, I think it's Delmar's cousin, and the law catches up with them. And the, the torches and the, the, the loudspeaker and the the dogs and we know you're in there come out and Delmar will wake or Everett wakes up and the first thing you know he has to my hair my hair you know and then the second thing we're in a tight spot we're in a tight spot we're in a tight spot 
He didn't know the answer, but he knew he was in a tight spot. Well, Jacob doesn't know the answer, but he knows he's in a tight spot. And so he's fleeing. He's a deceiver. He's just robbed his brother of his blessing by deceiving his father. There's just so much much that's not good with this man. How do you think God would treat such a man? Would you have chosen Jacob if you were God? And yet God has chosen him not for what he has accomplished in his life. God chose him before he was ever born. He chose him before the foundation of the world. So on his way, Jacob has a vision. Do you know that Jacob and Esau both, if you look at the timeline of Genesis, both of these boys knew Abraham. Can you imagine the stories their grandfather must have told? And yet until this point, there is no indication whatsoever that Jacob has any consciousness of God whatsoever. The blessing and all to him just meant stuff and advantage. It means the same to Esau. Even though you might like Esau better, Esau has no more spiritual apprehension at this point than Jacob does. It's not that God rejects Esau, this really good guy, we see in the text he's not a really good guy he's married Canaanite brides so here he is alone in the desert on a starry starry night Sinclair Ferguson said that and I just thought that was so cool he said, he must have been preaching in Scotland. He says, you know, when you say that to a, Scotland, or to a, to a Scottish person, he was talking about Don McLean. You know, Don McLean's most famous song was, what was it? Bye, bye, Miss American Pie. Wasn't my favorite one of his, but I, I mean, I like several of his songs. But that one goes on forever and ever. <laughs> it's like in the original version, six or seven minutes. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. And Ferguson says, he says, you know, there are not many Scotsmen who know what it means to drive your Chevy to the levee. (laughs) But McLean wrote another song. He was teaching guitar in a school, and he was reading some stuff that was there in the library, and he was reading about Vincent Van Gogh. And he wrote a song entitled Vincent. And it goes like this, starry, starry night, Paint your palette blue and gray. Look out on a summer's day with eyes that know the darkness in my soul. Now I understand what you tried to say to me, how you suffered for your sanity, how you tried to set them free. They did not listen. They did not know how. And then the refrain goes, perhaps they'll listen now until the end, and then it says, perhaps they never will. Van Gogh was a tortured soul. He was born in the home of a Dutch Reformed pastor. He grew up, I don't know his father preached grace or what, but he grew up and at first he was compliant, then he became rebellious, and and then as he went out into the world, his brother Theo supported him, but he, he just lived a miserable life to the point that finally he committed suicide. And his last words are famous last words. He said this, he says to his brother, the darkness will last forever. That's how he saw the future. The darkness will last forever. Well, on this starry, starry night, long, long ago, before the 1800s, before Vincent Van Gogh, Jacob has this vision that is not one of despair, but it is one of hope. He encounters God. He sees this great ziggurat that goes into heaven. He sees God at the top 
and the Lord Yahweh stands over and beside him. And on it, he sees angels going up. And Bo and I were talking about this yesterday. And the first thing it says here is the angels are ascending. That is, angels are back and forth between heaven and earth. And he sees this. These angels, these messengers, these guardians, these ministering spirits are there with Jacob. And so the covenant line is going to be reaffirmed and guarded by God Himself. And that brings us to the line. And the first thing you see here, when you think about the covenant line, not only is there Jacob who is the, the, the line of blessing, but there is Esau, like Ishmael, the seed of the serpent. Notice what Esau, what, e, what Esau does in verses 8, or verses 7 and 8, eight well, 8 through uh, 9. When Esau saw that his father was unhappy with him for marrying the Canaanite women and was sending Jacob to marry one of his cousins, Esau, who wanted to please his father, said, well, I'll do the same thing, only instead of going to Mesopotamia, I'm going to go east to the Ishmaelites, and I'm going to marry one of my father's cousins there. I'm going to marry an Ishmaelite. So you see this counterfeit thing, and that's the way Satan works. He's always counterfeiting. So, so Esau goes on a, a, on a journey, which is a, a parody of the journey of Jacob. To take a wife. To try to please his father. But he's doing it all wrong because he has no spiritual apprehension. Esau is a figure of tragic irony. He wants to belong. But he goes about everything in the wrong way. He has better personality traits than Jacob, but he does not have spiritual perception. Why? Why Jacob and not Esau? I'll tell you in one word. God. And so Jacob's motivation at this point is not faith. He's not out to please God. His motivation is mainly fear. He has received the blessing of Abraham, but the meaning of the blessing is still not appreciated. But God is gracious to him. So this man who has no consciousness of God at this point, who has not walked with God, now as he lays his head down on a, on a rock, God appears. God comes on the scene. In a... <laughs> I don't know the, the word escapes me. In a sensational manifestation of his presence between heaven and earth and he says to Jacob I am the Lord I am Yahweh the God of your father of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the land which your own I'm going to give to you and your descendants I'm going to make you a blessing to the nations wherever you go I am going to be with you I will not leave you until I have done what I promised to do Jacob didn't deserve any of that don't you see here the scandal of grace God if God had rejected Jacob and said chased him out of the land and separated himself from Jacob forever, what would we have said? That was right. That was right. But what God does, we say, that is gracious. That is grace. He is getting what he doesn't deserve. He is getting this blessing. He is getting this great hope that he's going to be in the covenant line why? Because this is God's plan. And even though this is a pivotal moment in Jacob's life, Jacob is still going to be a work in progress. 
But he'll never be the same after this. I just thank God, don't you? I thank God that here a man who has been guilty of guile and deceit is not chased away by God, is not rejected by God, but God appears to him to confirm to him his intention to bless him. Aren't you glad that the shameful past is not in view, but rather the glorious future of God's blessings and the fulfillment of his promises that he will accomplish himself. He says to Jacob all these things, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. This will happen. This covenant brings together heaven and earth. We know how important it is. That's how important it is. Brings together heaven and earth. Babel, Bo told us the word, one of the translations of the word was gateway to heaven. Gateway. Babel was not a gateway. Babel was a disaster. Bethel. Bethel is the place. He changes the name from Luz, which means hazelnut or nut, to Bethel, house of God. And he says, this is the place, this is the gate, look at it in verse 17, this is the gate of heaven. It's an awesome place, and it better translates awful place. He was terrified and yet encouraged. And then he makes the longest oath in the Old Testament. And it really tells you that he really doesn't get it yet, does he? Because how does he start it out in verse 20? If God. If God. Beloved, there's no if God. God doesn't deal in ifs or contingencies. God does. Don't you like the key words in this chapter, a certain place? A stone, rest, stand, heaven, earth, God, Lord. A certain place. What makes it certain? God. God does. Bethel is the place that signifies access to God. And Bethel is a place where God demonstrates his great grace, and his commitment to his plans. Now let's fast forward almost 2,000 years. Let's go from Genesis 28 to John chapter 1. Todd has already read the passage for us, but I want us to look at it just for a moment. I want to show you a few things about the passage. At the rate I'm going, you'll get there before I do. He began reading at verse 45. This is in the first chapter where Jesus is calling disciples. And Philip is, is just the, the outreach guy. He follows Jesus. He, he is talking to others. And then he finds Nathanael. And he said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the pro prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Don't you know, Philip, the Messiah is supposed to come out of Bethlehem, not Nazareth. And by the way, Beth Bethel is in northern Israel. It's where the Samaritans thought, and they named the place Mount Gerizim, and they had a place of worship there. And Jesus' ministry takes place in the north part of Israel for the majority of the time, right? Remember that? From Matthew. And so Nathaniel says to him, Okay, you think you know so much, you just come and see. And Nathaniel says, Okay, I think I will. So Nathaniel follows Philip, and 
Jesus sees him coming and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Does that word ring a bell with you? The word deceit? Should. When an Israelite thought of the greatest deceiver of all, who would he think of? Besides Satan, of course. Think of Jacob. Jacob deceived his father to get the blessing, right? It turned out to be a good thing, but of course, he still was a deceiver. And yet Jesus says to Nathaniel, hey, you're not a deceiver, are you? True Israelite. And Nathaniel said, how do you know me? How do you know my name? Jesus said to him, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. And Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Because he knew Jesus wasn't there. How did Jesus know I was under the tree? He must be the son of God. Jesus said, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you do, not, do you believe? Huh. You will see greater things than these. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's a direct allusion to chapter 28. So here is Jesus beginning his public ministry, calling out his disciples. And he meets Nathaniel. He calls him by name. And Jesus says, Nathaniel, I am the stairway to heaven. I'm the stairway to heaven. I'm the pontifex. You know, they call the Pope the pontiff. That means bridge. Well, the Pope is not the pontiff. He's not the bridge to God. That's heresy. Jesus is the only bridge to God. Jesus is the only gateway to heaven the only one the portal of heaven the portal to heaven from earth is through Jesus Christ and that's what we're being told and prefigured in the in the Old Testament in chapter 28 of Genesis that God is making this covenant and through this covenant ultimately when it is fulfilled it will be fulfilled in his son who is the gateway to heaven itself Hallelujah. Ascending and descending, later Jesus will tell Nicodemus in chapter 3 that the only one who has ascended to the Father is himself. Jesus is the nexus between God and man. The connection between God and man is Jesus Christ incarnate. Only he could reach us where we are by descending and becoming like us. That he might save us. We are not saved because we create a ladder to heaven through our good works or through our ethics or through our religion. We are saved because our sins are forgiven by Jesus Christ who took on human flesh. That he might rend the veil between us and God. And that our sins might be paid for on the cross in his body, in his death. That he might bring us. To God. He is the gateway. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It is not by human effort. It is not by human planning. We see that at the Tower of Babel. But the stairway that God makes, that descends out of heaven, it's not some puny effort from earth to heaven. But it is rather God's grandiose plan and grandiose work of redemption through His Son 
to build a ladder or a gateway, a stairway from heaven to earth that we might come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And I tell you, when we really understand that, it ought to bring joy to our hearts. It ought to bring singing to our lips that Jesus Christ is our gateway to heaven. He is our bridge. He is our everything. It is not by our works. We have not in any way, we are not able to overcome our sin, but Jesus has forgiven our sins by his death, and we are forgiven for his sake. And that is grace. That is amazing grace. That is grace abounding. And I thank God for it. Don't you? And I hope that everyone here this morning knows this grace and knows Christ, the way to God. And if you don't, I would love to talk with you. If you'd like to know more about how you can know Christ and trust in him, I'd like to tell you about that and for the online audience as well. You can call us at the church and we'd be glad to speak with you anytime. And I just hope that these words just cause you to, to get excited about what we see in the Bible when he tells us about our great Savior and our wondrous salvation. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this momentous passage that tells us that the way to heaven is not by our righteousness, by our works, is not by our efforts, but it is according to your plan and it is according to your work that you have accomplished this through your son and that we have come to you this great, great assembly through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray again that everyone here might rejoice in their salvation. I pray for those who don't know Christ that today you might begin to draw them and show them the, the futility of their efforts and that salvation is in Christ alone. And they must trust in him in order to know you and in order to have access to heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.